Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Erin Haynes, and welcome to the Inquirer Live. Uh, I'm the contributing editor for the Philadelphia Inquirer's A More Perfect Union, which is a series that has spent the last year examining the roots of systemic racism in America through the institutions that were founded in Philadelphia. Uh, today, I am excited, and I know you all are too, because of the interest that we've seen in this chapter uh, in discussing uh, chapter 11, which is the blueprint. Uh, together. Today, we are going to spend a little bit of time unpacking the story of America's first unplanned city, Philadelphia. Uh, William Penn City pioneered essential urban infrastructure, including the nation's first water system, street grid and public squares, uh, the precursor to today's urban parks. Uh, but also from the start, we have to acknowledge that these structures reinforced and drove racial inequities that have resulted in widespread disparities in Philadelphia and across the nation that persist today. So, Joining me for this conversation is the writer for this chapter, Layla A. Jones. Welcome, Layla. And we're also joined by visual artist Yannick Lowry, who is responsible for just the stunning and captivating imagery that you've seen that goes with Layla's fantastic journalism. Welcome, Yannick. Thanks for having me. And finally, we have urban planner Camille Bogan, who is going to help us as we talk about really reimagining what infrastructure can and should look like as we think about what a more perfect union looks like. Welcome, Camille. Thank you. Glad to be here. I am so glad to be with all of you. Uh, Layla, I just want to start with you as, as the writer for this chapter. I mean, this was such, uh, as I think back on it, um, kind of a high level concept for us, reimagining what infrastructure could look like in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, as somebody who is now a Philadelphian, talk a little bit uh, with me, if you will, about kind of your relationship uh, to the city and the city's infrastructure, how you were thinking about that going into this project and what it was that you wanted to say in this chapter specifically about how we get to a more perfect union in terms of our infrastructure. Um, yes, thank you for that. So for this chapter, you're right. It was it was really interesting to start with something as big as infrastructure. Um, and, you know, I am a reporter who's been writing about race and history, but not necessarily about those granular uh, level infrastructure items that we decided to zoom in on for this piece. And so one of the biggest things that I thought about early on for some of the areas like uh, water uh, is that I hadn't really ever thought about it before. I get my water out of the tap, uh, I drink it, and I take a shower. And so um, one of the things that was really interesting with that was to think about the fact that these infrastructure items were created um, for a specific purpose. And in the instance of water, it did have to do with white people in a really specific way. So uh, for example, the architect who, who created the water system he said that it would help to to cool uh, our nor our northern ancestors, basically Europeans who had moved to colonize Philadelphia and weren't comfortable in that in that hot climate. Um, and so, what I wanted to accomplish with this story at large is just kind of what I want to accomplish um, with the whole project in general, which is just to show that anywhere you see inequity, anywhere you see um, black people looking as if they're not being treated equitably or not necessarily taking advantage of uh, what the city has to offer with regard to its infrastructure. It's not a reflection on African Americans and our interactions with the infrastructure system so much as it is a reflection of uh, how the infrastructure was created on purpose and either sought to exclude Black people or completely ignored them altogether. And so now what we're doing is suffering the fallout of that and seeing the fallout of that um, in these different areas. You're on mute, Erin. I am on mute. Story of my work from home life. <laughs> <laughs> Camille, I want to come to you next because, I mean, just really this chapter was so powerful for me because it, it really helped me to, to, to recognize inequity as infrastructure, as part of our country's infrastructure, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, when we look at, for example, that this this um, section about water uh, or, or, or any of the other sections uh, that we unpack in this chapter, 
the idea of, of inequity as infrastructure in this country, how does it help us um, as Philadelphians, as Americans, to really think about what that has meant and, and what present day harm looks like and how we can move forward in a way that does not perpetuate that inequity? That's a really great question. I mean, um, urban planning itself as a profession was largely a white male uh, institution and a profession. It's something that no one else was really allowed to be a part of. It started with architects, actually, and engineers, um, who are the only ones who could have that skilled background to be able to build cities. So that bias really started with them of this being a profession where uh, it was a limited group of people and they were kind of standing afar and saying, this is what I think a city should be or what it should look like. And these are the people that I'm planning for. Um, and there was no one else who looked like us who were in those rooms. Uh, in fact, we probably weren't even able to be in those schools to be able to be in those rooms. Um, so from the very beginning, you know, a lot of black folks were just completely not thought of. And now being, you know, a black woman in the urban planning profession, which unfortunately is still a very uh, segregated profession. Um, there just still aren't a lot of black planners, black female planners. Um, and it is hard to undo a lot of those things when you have the same people in the room making the same decisions, uh, which is why it was so important for me to come into this field and be able to say, uh, I don't see myself represented in any of this infrastructure and people haven't for centuries. Uh, and is there something we can do about it? And a big part of that has been joining this profession, but then also doing things like this and talking about how, you know, what you see uh, was intentional. It wasn't just, um, you know, a, a consequence of where people chose to settle. It was uh, designed for us to not have access, for us to not have the same um, benefits and um, what's the word I'm looking for, amenities uh, as white folks have or as other um, racial groups have had uh, and is something that informs the way that I think about planning and informs the way that I'm also an advocate for uh, better planning and equitable planning because I know deep down that I was not supposed to be here and none of us were supposed to be here and yet here we are. Yeah, yeah, and and to your point, I mean, you know, think about our founding ideals, right? The idea that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is something that should belong to all Americans, but that is not something that just happens for every American, right? That is something that we have to be intentional about, and that is something that requires planning. And the idea that infrastructure can be a part of how we get to thinking about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, I mean, I think that that really... Um, it, it, that's why it was important for me for, for this particular chapter to be a part of the overall series, uh, because, again, uh, infrastructure being something that, that Philadelphians and Americans are, are, are interacting with every, you know, throughout their days. Right. Now that, that was to you, Camille. Sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> OK, I mean, absolutely. Uh, you know, the thing that always that I always think about when it comes to infrastructure is uh, People take it for granted that they can get on the bus, like Layla said, that you turn on the water and it works so you can take a shower. Um, but someone had to put those things into place and someone had to think about what it took to you know, have a sidewalk where you can walk down to get to the bus, to get on the bus. If every single one of those decisions was intentional. Um, and when you only have one perspective making those choices and walking that walk, then you are walking their walk as you make all these choices. When you're turning on the water, you are turning on the water as, say, the white man who planned that entire water system and not the person that you are actually using it. Or when you're trying to choose which bus route to take or what mode of transit, whether it's regional rail, like commuter rail, or the bus, um, you are walking in someone else's footsteps. And it is very likely that they, that person did not look like you and was not thinking of you uh, in the future to make those decisions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that just really shift, that can help shift our thinking from um, infrastructure as being routine to infrastructure as an experience, something that we experience, something that is an experience for us every single day. And so Yannick, that's why I, I want to come to you. And if we can, if we can pull up uh, the, the kind of original William Penn 
vision, for example, of water that we were just looking at before. Uh, I mean, Yana, you really helping us to encounter infrastructure as an experience. I think I think that really is what you have um, been able to accomplish through uh, these different uh, pieces that, that you have contributed to uh, to this chapter. Talk to me about how you approach this as, as an artist, as a Philadelphian, and as somebody who is really trying to help us reimagine what the infrastructure of our city can look like. Yeah, um, honestly, this is such a huge, uh, it was a huge task, honestly, to just think about what hasn't been thought about before. I mean, just listening to Camille speak about the infrastructure being laid out in a way that didn't have us in mind, didn't have our futures in mind, didn't have you know, our, our day-to-day lives really as a consideration. So to kind of you know, go against that, a lot of my practice really circles around and thinking about how Black people live in the future and how we thrive today. And I think to do that, it's based in a lot of history because you know nothing is just completely new. Everything is a component or a compilation of things that have been. So this project really was, you know, a mirror of that. You know, looking at this image here of these uh, these old grid systems and thinking about what it was and what it could have been and what it could still potentially be. So starting from here, you know, I really just wanted to kind of piggyback on that initial idea that I think Latrobe had when he was speaking about these water pools that were designated all around the city uh, as public baths, he called it. Um, that really just kind of struck me, that idea of having you know, these abundant water sources available for everyone. When I say everyone, of course, I'm not speaking about <laughs> everyone, but yeah. yeah, if it was for everyone, you know, what that would look like and you know what that would mean for a city like Philadelphia. Um, are you able to go to the next? Uh, so here in these kind of grids, uh, I, I kind of place these little mini oasis, or, or, or I like to call it. Um, and thinking about what that type of you know landscape would look like, and the joy it might bring to communities that look like ours, well, look like mine. Um, but in you know in the back of it all always, unfortunately, there's this um, there's this gaze here. So you have this police officer that's in the bottom right. Um, it, there seems to be a consistent, you know, overlook. You know, there's never like a complete relaxation or, or comfort in this country, it feels like. Um, as a Black person, you, you always have to kind of have to have your head on a swivel for whatever reason. Yeah. And I wanted to include that because that's such a, a prevalent reality uh, here in Philadelphia and in many cities all, all around the country. Um, so on and one hand, you have this, sorry. The myth of the public space, right? I mean, these spaces are not really public if they are being policed in this in this way, if, 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 if certain bodies are being policed and, and are not actually free to take advantage of, of infrastructure that should be uh, and and is is said to be available for all, but that everybody's not having an equal experience with that infrastructure, right? Exactly. And equal access to that infrastructure. Exactly. Um, one of the things that kept coming up throughout this project um, was leisure versus uh, loitering, or loitering versus leisure. You know, this kind of idea that we have to be doing something purposeful or functional. You know, without just we can't just be in a place without you know knowing what the purpose is or having someone you know questioning what it is so i'm thinking about you know amy cooper mm -hmm. uh, and the bird watching incident i'm thinking about you know just i mean there's dozens i don't have to recap it but this is the kind of underlying tone that i had to kind of illustrate throughout this uh this project and it was really i learned so much it was it was an incredible experience yeah, if we can just look at the last the last slide in this in this particular installment, talk about what's happening here. So here is the I guess the base layer of that that composition, um, and this is at its purest, you know, most most joyful. You know, you notice that the police officer isn't there. You know, you have these scenes like these where I'm not sure if they still do it, but when I was growing up, this was just every summer. You know, this was part of my childhood. 
you know, and thinking about having that access, you know, today and across the city and, and what it meant for me and what it could mean, you know, is really, you know, kind of the sentiment in this original layer. To add on to that grid, you know, as kind of like the overlay, just really was, you know, to frame it literally and figuratively as a way that we can, you know, kind of see this happen. Um, and I think, you know, it came together really piece by piece. There were other drafts and, I, and I'm glad that this one got, you know, finally selected, but there were so many visions of futures that included us as far as water equity. And I think this was just the most successful. I'm glad how it turned out. So are we. Uh, we listen, you brought up Amy Cooper. Uh, I want to talk to you about uh, the section on parks. And I also just want to encourage everybody who is tuning in. Uh, if you have not yet seen Chapter 11, The Blueprint, I highly encourage you to uh, to view it either on your uh, on, on whichever device uh, is available to you, your phone, your tablet, your laptop um, in particular, because this is a very dynamic and interactive experience that that makes uh this this work and this journalism that much more powerful so i just i just want to encourage folks to do that if they haven't had a chance to do it after uh or even as as we're sitting here having this conversation if you just want to click and scroll through that as we're as we're talking uh that is completely fine because we can't see you anyway and we we won't tell uh so here we have uh this map of Washington Square uh, in Philadelphia, which uh, I'm sure some of you uh, may recognize. Yannick, do you want to talk about kind of what this brought up for you? Uh, and maybe Camille, you can chime in too. What what this particular image, William Penn's vision of, of Washington Square in Philadelphia, what does this bring up for you to just look at this document? Yeah, I mean, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, firstly, let me just say, we tried to work with mostly maps because they are a visual reference of like infrastructure. Like how do you, you know, that's kind of an abstract theme, honestly, but when you just look at it in a map, it kind of places things in context. So as a, like I said, as a figurative and literal framing for the work that we were doing, I was really thinking about parks as places where we could just enjoy nature. Um, that's that's something that I think has been lost. Um, and I think it's something that really is beneficial in any city, just to contrast, you know, this concrete kind of lifestyle, being in that kind of natural environment, I think people can gain something from. But I think that a lot of times, you know, there's just a, uh, it goes back to that loitering thing or leisure thing. Le finding leisure and simple activity like going to a park is something that I, I, I always try to encourage in my personal work and, you know, in my friendships and whatever. But for this project here, we're looking at Washington Square as, okay, what if this place was, you know, another oosis for people to enjoy themselves freely? So yeah. I imagined and the per perfect park. Mm -hmm. and, and, and to your point, I mean, this was a place where people were enjoying themselves freely, right, Layla? I mean, talk a little bit about the history of Washington Square. It was not just a place of leisure. It was a place of celebration for folks until it wasn't. Talk, talk, to, um, talk to people tuning in about, about that history in Washington Square. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny because William Penn did intend for these green spaces to be attractive and to be leisurely. Um, places to reconnect with nature in his urban city, even though it was mostly still green at that time anyways. Um, but it was very clear from the onset that they did not mean that for Black people. Like, not you. We meant that for people who look like us, not for people who look like me. And so um, the Africans who were enslaved in the city prior to um, the abolition of slavery, they would gather at Washington Square in particular um, to have celebrations to celebrate their different holidays. Um, the only early account that I was able to find in my time doing this was from a, a white historian who talked about um, Africans dancing um, and speaking in their native tongues with various instruments for these celebrations. But additionally, Washington Square um, 
was also a burial ground because before these parks became what we think of as parks today, they were kind of neglected um, and they became potter's fields as well as like dumping grounds and grazing yards. So this was literally, the idea was that Africans were coming to this particular spot because they knew it was probably the only place and the only place in the city where their ancestors or loved ones were able to be buried anyways. Um, but there are notes from Philadelphia Common Council with City Council now that show, you know, in the 1700s, people were complaining about the celebrations that Africans were having there. So that policing of Black people in public space has a really specific origin point and um, what it looks like. And I talked to this historian named Victoria Walcott, Dr. Victoria Walcott, and she um, tied a really specific line, a really clear line between those early moments where Black people were disallowed from public space when they were the only ones really using it correctly at the time. <laughs> um, they were disallowed from public space. She threaded it through, you know, a lot of the race riots or really attacks of white people attacking black people for using public space in Philadelphia. That happened at a merry-go-round in, in the 1800s. It happened in the 1950s at a park um, it called Woodside that closed some of its areas rather than to allow equal admittance to black people. And then she threaded it through. She said those calls to police. So like yeah. what was talking about, the early times where black people were outlawed for public space has been threaded through that, you know, we're not allowed to be leisurely in a park. And so people like Amy Cooper calling the police on um, the gentleman who was bird watching or even taking it the next step, an uh, individual calling the police on Tamir Rice who was playing on a, on a playground. It's just like when you see black people in a public space, it causes an anxiety and that is historic and it was intentional. Yeah, yeah, the, the idea that, that white um, comfort or white discomfort um, can, can lead to ideas about black criminalization um, mm -hmm. that, that, are, that are not real. Uh, and really that's also been tied to like improvements in parks. So one of the advocates I talked to talked about how she was fighting for improvements to her neighborhood park. And as the neighborhood started to change, those improvements began to be made. But um, so that's a good thing. But on the flip side of that, now the police are being called on men who grew up in that area, who have frequented that part their whole life. Now they're feeling ostracized because the neighborhood is whitening and improvements yes. come. But it also means you don't belong here anymore. Right. That, that's part of their idea of what it means to improve that park. Mm -hmm. that they're no longer welcome. Um, if we can go back to uh, the park's. Uh, imagery and just show uh, Yannick's reinterpretation of Washington Square, which I, I just, this is so beautiful. Yannick, can you just, can you just talk to us about uh, your Washington Square, uh, which frankly feels much more welcoming to me than William Penn's <laughs> version? Thank you. Uh, yeah, this was a, a fun, a fun composition. Honestly, so that woman is actually my grandmother. We were visiting, well, she was visiting me here. Um, and we went to Longwood Gardens. And of course, you know, she's my grandmother, but more than that, I really wanted to just represent a woman in the park, you know, without any other context, you know, just because that's okay, that's enough. And I wanna see more of that, you know, that kind of just carelessness, that, that carefree kind of mindset. Um, so I imagine just the most perfect ideal park I could ever think about. And of course, Longwood Gardens is stunning. Uh, it, it's perfectly manicured and taken, well taken care of. And one, one of the lines in um, the article, you know, speaks about a butterfly garden that they, you know, had a hope for including into the park. So I thought about that and included, included those elements to kind of just bring everything together, it's almost like a, like a portal into what Washington Park could be or yeah. what it, you know, should be. Yes. And she belongs, right? Like that is, that right. is, she belongs there, right? right? Because, because she is there and that's, that, that's enough. And I love that. Uh, well, before we, we do have some audience questions, but before we go to those, I do want to talk about just, just one more aspect of this chapter, and that is the chapter that we did on uh, transit, uh, which 
I found so fascinating, uh, but I know um, that uh, transit is also uh, an area of expertise for you, Camille. So uh, if we can, yes, bring up uh, our chapter on transit. Layla, I want you to tee us up here uh, with this and talk about um, kind of what your reporting showed about the origins of transit in Philadelphia and how um, that inequity, what the inequity that was also present uh, in those origins. Sure, yeah. Uh, well, my reporting found that transit started in Philadelphia with the omnibus system, really just like a carriage pulled by a horse with multiple people who were able to get on. But almost immediately, it was extremely racist. So um, I read this newspaper account from, I believe, 1893 that was reminiscing over the system. And it showed that uh, the second ever bus line in the city was called Jim Crow after a minstrel, a famous one. And not only was it called Jim Crow, but it had the Jim Crow minstrel, the grotesque caricature with the black face and the white mouth um, painted on the side, on both sides of the vehicle. So it's just like, imagine being black. By 1833, you do have black people in the city and a free black population here too. Uh, I, I just don't think they would have felt very welcome to get on to that vehicle at all. And also so that, their dignity, their humanity, every exactly. time that they had to interact with, with this vehicle. Exactly, exactly. So, I mean, that's race early in transit. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't really get more stark than that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and Camille, talk to me about your work around this specific area of infrastructure um, that, that we also discuss in, in Layla's reporting. Uh, talk to me, uh, talk to our audience about Caroline LeCount. For people um, yes, Caroline LeCount um, was, you know, an influential transit act ad activist. Um, she saw that people like her just could not move around the city with dignity uh, in the same way that white folks and white women were able to get to where they needed to go on a bus where they wanted to. Um, and much like Rosa Parks, she was like, absolutely not. I deserve to use this system and I'm gonna get on it uh, and I'm gonna use it. And if you have a problem with that, uh, I will raise hell, which is frankly what black women have been doing uh, since they arrived in this country uh, and have continued to do. And has really inspired me. You know, I grew up in the suburbs and I didn't have a car. I have many siblings, just couldn't afford it. Uh, and from time to time had to take the bus and waiting for a bus in the dark that you don't know is gonna come uh, feels bad. You see everyone driving by looking at you and you don't feel comfortable and you think, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be somewhere else. I can't move with dignity. And the biggest thing for me was uh, watching mothers or caregivers with their children you know, standing there with the diaper bag and the grocery bags and the stroller and the kid and this tiny opening on the bus that you have to squeeze through and you got to tap or swipe your card or pay for every kid that you're with. And then there's no room on the bus for your stroller and your bags and for your kids to sit. And it's another one of those spaces where it's not built for us or for them or for anyone that isn't someone just getting on with their briefcase and going to work mm -hmm. uh, and then going back home. And we really still see that today with the separation of, you know, the L and the Broad Street line and the buses versus the regional rail system, which has wide cars, you know, comfy seats, uh, has a quiet car if you like need to get work done. Um, and it's more expensive. And it was intentionally designed that way to keep the people who could afford to use it, who were commuting uh, to and from the suburbs into Center City to work. Uh, comfortable while everyone else who ne also needed to get to work or to school or to the grocery store um, crammed together on the trolleys and on the buses and on the trains uh, because it was making a point that this nice system is for these people and we built it for them. But the rest of this, this is fine for you. You can use this. Um, and this is kind of the history, not just of Philadelphia, but in all of the um, transportation systems across the U.S. You know, many major cities have these commuter rail systems that are better run, they're better funded, they have nicer, uh, cleaner cars, they're uh, safer because they're more well lit, they have stops uh, where you can park your car and get on and you never have to interact with anyone else when you're getting on it. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. This is this map totally ignores uh, one Philadelphia in, in favor of another Philadelphia, right? Uh, let's look at the map that Yannick envisions. Yes. And there you are, Camille. <laughs> it's Caroline. I love this. Let's talk about it. So, yeah, this map, um, that original image, again, we're working with maps, just shows, I think that's Broad Street straight down. And of course, it's leaving out a lot, but it's um, still kind of illustrates like what is going on in the city and what is valued and what isn't, basically. So my idea with this one was really to kind of create like a form of currency, um, almost like a dollar bill or some type of, you know, C-note. Literally and figuratively, you have the count here looking at Camille, you know, who's actually continuing this work that unfortunately still needs to be done. And Camille, like I found this image of you, I think you were like working on something, but the, the <laughs> gestures of your hands was so kind of meaningful to me as just like making a lane, making a way for this woman who's stepping onto this bus, who's highlighted. And she's stepping out of this scene of, you know, full of, it's a crowd of men. And I think it really just speaks to, you know, her having that access, you know, her being lifted up and seen as somebody that's valuable and important. And that's what we need more of uh, as far as, you know, this public transit equity, because it's just not like you just described, it's just not there. And um, these are the people who, you want to see taken care of. I, I just saw, it always comes back to my mom for me. It's like, if my mom's getting on the bus, I want everybody to step off. I want everybody <laughs> to step back. You know what I mean? My little sister, if I had one, a niece, you know, these are just the people you really want to see taken care of and treated well. Um, so that's what was on my mind. Um, but honestly, this all just was drawn from the work that Camille was doing. And of course the incredible writing that, that Layla put in and it just really came together. Yes. Magically, yeah. Yes, it did. I loved the story that you, you told in the in, in this chapter about how when you were a kid riding the train, your job was to run and find a seat for your mom. Oh yeah, I, I lived on the train. Like I grew up on the train. Like we never, I just got my license like a few years ago. So I know the train very, very well. And that was like my role was to kind of like scout out the seats, you know, grab for my mom or tell somebody to get up or whatever. Like that was just how it went. And I didn't realize people didn't do that <laughs> until I got a little older. But listen, maybe more um, more people should do that. More people should make sure that folks have a seat, right? And and you are literally in this image here, including us in the story of transit, including us in how transit is is thought about in this country. Okay, well, this has been a, such a great conversation. I want to uh, just take a moment to try to get to a couple of questions from. Our audience, you all had some really fantastic questions. We were joking earlier that, uh, you know, we need we need like, uh, you know, some PhDs here to be able to answer some of the things that y'all want to know about this, but, but we will try our best. Um, there is a question from um, Alyssa Schroeder. So thank you for that question, Alyssa. Alyssa is asking, how much did race play a part in the planning of school locations? And how intentional were the choices surrounding schools and neighborhoods with regard to race? Now, I will tell you all, I had to consult our More Perfect Union historian uh, on this question because I did not know the answer, uh, Brenna Holland, who um, is um, uh, an excellent historian who says um, she doesn't know with certainty off the top of her head either, but most of the school buildings in Philadelphia were built in the mid 20th century. And this, of course, was during uh, the Great Migration. And so uh, that was uh, almost, race was almost certainly a factor in thinking about where these schools were gonna go, who could use them. And, and of course the, the, the city grid was, was pretty, um, pretty much set and, and folks were um, pretty well divided uh, across the city um, you know, by the early 20th century. So, so race, uh, the short answer is that race almost certainly played a pretty huge role in, in um, in, in where schools were uh, just by virtue of how neighborhoods were organized in the city. Uh, let's see. We have a question. 
I'm fascinated. Catherine, Catherine Whipple is asking, I'm fascinated by the history of SEPTA and Philadelphia's public transport. Um, I'm curious about those intersections and how certain lines were created, prioritized, or deprioritized. Camille, do you have any insight into this particular question? Um, I do have some insight. Uh, you know, the way that, that bus routes or train routes are planned are largely planned by demand. So planners kind of look at where are people most likely to be getting on and off uh, and then kind of plan outwards from there. And so in Philadelphia, Center City is kind of the area traditionally where you would have a lot of demand, people getting on and off to get to and from work, you know, because historically people came in from the outer suburbs, downtown, and then left. Um, so any lines that took you directly from wealthier suburbs to the city and back were more prioritized. But there's also uh, the, um, uh, the cost of the line, which I kind of talked about earlier, is that uh, the lines where they think people can afford to pay more, uh, they will charge more. And using that money, they will use that money to make the line look nicer. So that's why you see a lot of the regional rail lines have much nicer stations. Um, they'll be well lit, they'll be more seating, uh, heated or not. Uh, because they are able to use that extra revenue from wealthier people to uh, prioritize the way that the line uh, and the infrastructure of that line looks or feels. Whereas bus lines are pretty inexpensive to run and they're cheaper, which means uh, people aren't going to be paying as much. And therefore, they're not going to put as much investment into those with like shelters or stops or benches uh, because it's just not a priority for who is using those lines more. Uh, and to take a step further is a lot of transportation planning focuses on work trips. And so it's also thinking about who's going to be using this line for work. But that's we know that that's not all people use transit for. They use it to get to school. They use it to visit family, to uh, go out and have fun. Um, and, you know, if we looked at that in terms of demand, we might see that there is more demand for other types of trips and that other lines should be prioritized. Absolutely. Uh, well, I just in the, in the time that we have left, I just want to ask each of you, you know, now that you um, kind of have had a chance to think more deeply about uh, not just the history of infrastructure in our city, but really how that infrastructure can be different and be more equal for uh, the residents of our city. Um, I guess what it, does, if you have a final thought to share about what you learned from this chapter and what you hope that folks who read this chapter and are wondering what they can do or how they can start to reimagine our infrastructure, uh, what that final thought is. Uh, Layla, I'll start with you. Sure. Um, yeah, I would say I learned a lot through the people like Camille that I spoke with who could really speak to like the present day harms as well as looking to what the future could be in a more ideal world. And so, for example, and some of it was just as simple as like for the streets chapter that we didn't get to talk about, but you all can go read because it's still up online. Um, just, uh, he called it Sankofa planning, which was using the history of a African history to think about the future of what our street grid and our streetscape could look like, just how black people could be included in the replanning of the city streets. Um, and so what I would hope people would take away from it is just that having the information about our history completely informs our present and that we can use it to um, improve the future. And I hope that they will be able to hold um, decision makers to account about ways to, um, to be anti-racist by including black people at the very beginning of all the plannings and, and throughout the entire planning stage and in leadership roles too and in the most creative ways that you know folks can think of yeah we can be architects we can yeah. imagine what our infrastructure needs to look like um camille i'll come to you next absolutely um what I wanted, what I want others to take away from this is you know yannick's art is beautiful and one, I want people to know, especially the Black folks in the city, is that you can do this. Like, you deserve this, and this is something that you are capable of. Yes, we can be architects. And there's a big mayoral race coming up soon, and I hope that everyone has a physical copy of Yannick's art in this piece, 
And when those campaigners come to your door and knock and ask for that vote, you hold that up and say, I want this. If you want my vote, tell me how we're going to get this. Because I think that that's, the art is really powerful and the story is powerful. And, you know, our, our leaders can make those changes. They're absolutely capable of it. Uh, we just need to keep asking for what we deserve because we can have nice things. Uh, and we can be in these spaces. We just need to keep asking for it. And like Layla said, holding our leaders accountable for making that happen. Yeah. Black women and butterflies unmolested in public parks. Yes, uh, definitely a platform for 2023, but also just um, making, making sure that all of us are thinking about people who don't necessarily look like us when we think about how things can be different and caring about what their experience is with our infrastructure. Uh, well, Yannick, the last word goes to you. Final thought on infrastructure and how people can use their imagination to make this real. Yeah, pressure. Uh, <laughs> honestly, what both of both of you said just now really just resonated with me. I, I mean, I, I echo both of those ideas. I think um, this 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 piece really taught me a lot. I learned. Okay, we all know that this wasn't meant for us. We all know that there's, you know, inequality, but knowing the details and the processes that were behind it and the thoroughness of this article really kind of puts things in perspective about how we can make a change for what's next. I think um, a big part of history and, and digging into it is to learn a pattern for, or a new system of doing things differently. So. That's what I'm focused on purely, like understanding what happened so that we can move forward and in a different and more effective way. Um, so I do that through my work, but that's not the only way to do it. This, this, is, this will take a myriad of talents and capabilities that we all have. So let's, let's, let's make it happen. You do it in your Moving work. Forward. You do it as a person, as, as a person that you've done, you've done since you were a little boy. Be somebody that is making space for others and see your fellow Philadelphians. I think that that is just what I hear from all of you. Um, if we can do that, then, then perhaps we can get to a more perfect union around our infrastructure. Well, I want to thank uh, all of you, uh, Layla and Camille and Yannick for joining us for the Inquirer Live's latest installment of A More Perfect Union. I wanna thank our audience for joining us and for such interesting and thought-provoking questions. Uh, you can read Layla's article, The Blueprint, and previous articles in our More Perfect Union series, which is just wrapped uh, by visiting inquirer.com slash moreperfectunion. Uh, you can also sign up for a free newsletter to receive notifications around our articles uh, as, as, as they are published. There's one more essay that's coming from me. I guess I'll have to think of something uh, profound to say to kind of wrap uh, up what has really been an incredible year of journalism. Uh, I'm your host again, Aaron Haynes, contributing editor for More Perfect Union. Have a great evening and a happy holiday season and happy new year, everybody. Bye. <laughs>